here or whether you're online with us, uh, please stand for our first song, Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name, praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise proclaim, all his hosts together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high, praise him, O ye have not. above the sky. Let them praise us, give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, for Sky. Let them praises give Jehovah. They were made at his command. Them forever he established. His decree shall stand. From the earth of oh, praise Jehovah. Holy flood, ye dragons all. Oh, Fire and hail and snow and vapors, stormy winds that hear him call. Let them praise his good Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. All ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly. And all ye people, princes, greatest judges, all praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children, small. Let them praise his gift, Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome, and I'm so glad that you are here to worship with us, whether you're in person or online. Um, if you are visiting with us, if you could fill out a Get to Know You card that you can find in the front of your seats, because um, we would love to get to know you and talk with you and exchange you that info card for a free mug. I think it's a pretty good deal. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, you can also put them on the card in front of you, or you can put it in on our website. Um, and then I have some announcements. So next Sunday is our senior Sunday, and we will be celebrating our graduating high school seniors. Uh, we have five this year. We have Hannah Richardson, Rachel McRandall, Kristen Johnston, Lorelai Eckert, and Francis Munzar. Um, Sunday after church, we will be having a potluck, so if you can pr please bring some food, that would be really appreciated. 
And if you are free and able, if you could help set up tables that Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, it would be really appreciated. Um, Phil Weiss is kind of running that, so if you have questions about setting up tables or anything, you can talk to him. Um, this summer, we also have some youth ministry events, and if you want to know more about how you can be involved with the youth ministry, please let me know. Um, we are running on volunteers, and we would love to have you guys come and hang out with teenagers. Uh, some of the events that we have going on are all church welcome, so if you are interested, you can totally come. Um, but the one coming up this month is a movie night on June 17th. It'll take place from 6 to 9 p.m., and it will be in the well in the other building. Movie to be decided soon. <laughs> and then for our children's ministry, if you would like to teach our children or hang out with the babies in the nursery and teach them, please contact Sarah or Ryan. They have their teachers for June, but from July onward, they are looking for teachers. So if you are able and willing, uh, please talk to Sarah and Ryan. Let's worship together. There we go. After this song, Claire Spinka has a scripture reading for us. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawn. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger, your name is great and your heart is kind, for all your goodness I will keep on. Singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending, ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul, oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll 
worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. Revelation 19, 4 through 8. When the 24 out the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, both you, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like pe loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah. For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon the throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing. King through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of love, who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glory is now. Sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of peace, whose power a scepter sways from Absorbed in prayer and praise, his reign shall know no end, and round his pierced feet, fair flowers of paradise extend. Fair still the woodland. 
hands. Rolled in the blooming of spring. Jesus is fairer. Jesus is purer. Who makes the Fair is the sunshine, fair is still the moonlight, and all the twinkling starry holes. Jesus shines brighter. than all the angels heaven can boast. After this song, we'll share in the Lord's Supper. How beautiful hands that serve the wine and the bread and the sons of the earth how beautiful the feet that walked the long dusty road and the hill to the cross
and I just wanted to be alone. So we went across the lake in a deep boat. But when he arrived, people ran and surrounded him. It was a big crowd. Maybe like 20 people. One, two, three, four, five, six, seventy-eight. The crowd had 5,000 people. The people followed Jesus all day. It was getting late and the people haven't eaten dinner. The people were starving. I'm hungry! We need food! We need food! We need food! So the disciples told the people, Go home! Eat dinner! Bye-bye! See you tomorrow! But Jesus wanted them to stay. You should give them something to eat, like... Cherries. <laughs> The disciples said, what shall we do? Then one of the disciples whispered to Jesus, We only have five loads of brush, bread and two fish. So Jesus said, Is that so? Bring them here to me. So Jesus lifted the bread and fish in the air. And he said, Thank you, God, for this food. Please bless it to our tummies. Yummy, yummy. Amen. Jesus turned them into hundreds of bread and tons of fish. <laughs> Would you look at that? Whoa, how did he do that? That's awesome. That's amazing. That's so cool. Then Jesus broke the bread and gave it to the people. Wait a minute, if they broke the bread, how could they eat it? Jesus gave the bread to the disciples so they can feed everybody. There was so many fish and so many bread. They could eat as many as they wanted. After eating, everyone was so happy and so full that they couldn't get off the ground. Oh, Mom, I'm so full. The people were starting to go home, and Jesus said, Bye-bye. See you later. Hasta la vista. The end. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody. I, uh, I thought... Having those children help us remember Jesus would be a good way to approach the table this morning. Uh, maybe they got some of the details wrong. Um, who knows? Maybe when we remember Jesus, uh, certain things stand out to us more than others. But this is what Jesus called his followers to do, is to remember him. Do this in remembrance of me, the bread and the juice. And that's what we're going to do now. This is Memorial Day weekend, and I can't help but see a connection between the memorials that we have in our country and the communion table as an opportunity to remember Jesus. And we're not just called to remember the cross. Yes, Jesus went to the cross. He died. He gave his life. But we're not celebrating a cross. We're not remembering a cross. In the same way, if you go to the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., it's, it's a memorial not just of a person, although when you look at it, you're like, yep, there he was. He was a guy, he was a lawyer, he was a president, he had a beard, but it goes much deeper than that. We remember the person, we remember the, the image. The memorial reminds us of what that person did and the impact that it had in its time and the impact that it continues to have on us today. And the same is true whenever we gather around the table to remember the life the death, the ministry, and I would say most importantly, the resurrection of Jesus. We're reminded of his body, the miracles he performed, the, the things he taught, the compassion that he showed, the, the, the food that he multiplied, the people that he fed, both physically and spiritually. We remember, we take the juice and we remember it, it wasn't just blood that was shed on the cross, but it was 
the very blood of God, the creator, in human form, willing to lay down his life as an atonement for our sin. And that's the message of reconciliation. The, the, we can have a right relationship with God. We can be reunited with our God that we've been estranged from. We remember this and so much more whenever we gather around the table. So I invite you to remember Jesus with me this morning, his, his sacrifice. Uh, the cross, but not just the cross. The fact that Jesus isn't on the cross anymore. They took him down, they put him in a tomb, and he's not in the tomb anymore. He is alive. And as we've been studying Revelation, we are reminded where he is. And that is, he is enthroned. He is king above all kings. And we, as his followers, have pledged our allegiance to him. Let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, for the bread and the fish. And thank you, Jesus, for the bread and the cup, your body and your blood broken and spilled for us because of your great love, because of your great compassion for us. We remember your love today and each day, and we are overwhelmed by it. We come with hearts of joy, hearts of gratitude, thanking you and asking that you will help us to be more like you in the way that we show this compassion to others as we continue the ministry that you demonstrated for us here on earth. We celebrate the, the, the home, the hope we have in heaven, the life beyond this life that we are promised through your blood. Lord Jesus, you paid it all, and all to you we owe. We love you, and we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. At this time, go ahead and peel back your uh, foil on your container. Take the bread. This is the body of Christ that was broken for you. Peel back your, uh, your juice, and you can drink that now as well. This is the blood of Jesus that was shed for you. I forgot one, so I'm going to go back in the foyer and get one myself, and I will join you in remembering Jesus. You need one? You, I think you do. Ooh. I will thank you, thank you, Lord, thank you. I will thank you, thank you, Lord, thank you. I will thank you all the days of my life. I will thank you, thank you, Lord, thank you. I will thank you, thank you, Lord, thank you. I will thank you all the days of my life. I also want to, um, at this time, uh, remind us of the, the ministry uh, you can participate in, the, the financial ministry, the, the, the worship form of uh, giving. I'm tripping over my words here. Maybe I should start over. This time, I want to remind you that you can give financially to this congregation, and we will do our best to use the funds to further the work of Jesus here in this community and beyond. And as I've said before, I just want to... I, I uh, am paid by this church, and so a lot of what is put contributed when we gather together uh, goes to me and makes it so I can buy groceries and have five kids and diapers and all that kind of stuff. So thank you for, for supporting me in partnering with this church in this ministry. And uh, keep our missionaries in your prayers. And just my, my, my thanks go to all of you for, for partnering in this way. I was reminded this morning uh, of the, the ministry of worship that so many of our volunteers participate in, all of our singers, our, uh, our worship coordinators, and uh, people in the back who are helping us with the tech stuff. And this is, uh, I really appreciate that as well, the volunteer hours that they put in. The singers show up early every Sunday and just, just make sure they go over their parts just to help us be able to lift up our worship before the Lord in a way that is pleasing to, to him and that I, I kind of personally enjoy myself, but uh, a lot of things to be thankful for yeah, within this congregation. And anyway, so yeah, if you want to give at this time or sometime this week or online, there are ways of doing that and we appreciate your participation in this ministry through that channel. Okay. At this time, we want to dismiss our kids 
who can go to kids worship over in the Family Life Center. This is a program for children ages, say it with me, four through fifth grade. Wait a minute, I say this every week. You don't know by now? This is a program for kids ages four through fifth grade. You got it, four through fifth, you guys are like, Jacob, that's the time when I tune you out and get my gum ready and uh, anyway, I appreciate the volunteers who teach these kiddos each week, uh, especially because a lot of my kids are in this program. If you have a child that is age three or under, you can have them go to the class in the nursery with, I believe it's Ryan and Sarah right now for the last Sunday of the month. Those are located right across from the, the bathrooms, our nursery program over there. And as Brittany mentioned earlier, if you'd like to teach some of these kids and just have fun spending time with them, teaching them Bible lessons, Talk to me, talk to Ryan and Sarah, talk to Brittany. We would love to have you on board. Cool. Next Sunday, I am excited because, as Brittany mentioned also, it is our senior celebration. Each year we have high school seniors getting ready to graduate. We want to recognize them. We want to pray for them. We want to celebrate the accomplishment that they have done. This year, I have asked four of our graduating seniors, well, I asked all of them, and four of them said, yes, I'm willing to help you out with this. I asked them if they would share some of their reflections on their spiritual formation here at Trivell. I asked them to write a three to five minute reflection talk on some spiritual truth that they have learned uh, over the past few years. And I've been meeting with these seniors. I've even got to preview some of the, the scriptures that they're going to share with us or these truths that God has put on their hearts. And I, I, I just need to say, you are going to be blessed. It is going to be a feast next week. This is going to be awesome. So I want you to join me in praying for these seniors as they prepare to stand up here and do something that's a little bit different, that's a little bit scary, but they are putting themselves out there. And uh, again, this is going to be a really exciting thing to ha have happen with us next Sunday. Our seniors, as mentioned earlier, who are going to be speaking are Hannah and Rachel and Kristen and Lorelai. So please keep them in your prayers next week. Uh, yes. Speaking of four things that, uh, <laughs> this is such a weird connection, but it's the number four. Uh, you may have noticed in the scripture reading that Claire shared with us uh, earlier in the service that there was the word hallelujah used. And if Rick Cross was here, he'd probably have said it three or four times by now. Hallelujah. And we know that word. It shows up in a lot of our worship songs. But did you know that the word hallelujah only shows up four times in the entire Bible. And all four times are in Revelation 19. I bet you didn't know that. That doesn't really have anything to do with our lesson today. It's just a fun fact that I thought I would point out for you. And you may have wondered, okay, well, there's this celebration happening, and that's not unusual for Revelation, but what exactly is being celebrated in Revelation 19? Well, are all the kids out of the room? Make sure we don't have any kids left in here. Uh, they are celebrating the destruction of the great prostitute. Okay, who's with me? Uh, if you're a kid and you're online, sorry, maybe I should have given you a little bit more warning. The celebration in Revelation 19 is a celebration of what happens in Revelation 17 and 18. And it involves this image of a deceptive, alluring, destructive prostitute. That's what we're going to talk about a little bit this morning. But before we get there, uh, I feel like I just need to pray. I've prepared some thoughts. It's kind of a weird text, and I just want to start by saying, Lord, take whatever I have here, uh, whatever is in your, your word, and use it for your purposes, and uh, let me get out of the way. So let's pray. Lord, you are, you are Lord of all. We learn so much about you as we sing your praises in the, the hymns that we have, as we read the words of Revelation and we listen to the praises that are sung, the celebrations, the, the things that are important to you, the things that you are doing away with, we, we have a better understanding of who you are and what you want for this world. We get a better idea of what you would have us do as followers of Jesus. And so this morning, as we look at a, an unusual text, uh, I pray that you will speak to us, that anything that I have to say will say what needs to be said, anything that I say that's just wrong or bumbling or useless, I just pray that it's forgotten and that we move on. But in all things, 
Lord, we come before you because we want to be more like Jesus. We want to see your kingdom come. We want to see more and more people say, Jesus is Lord. So we pray that your will is done in the next few minutes during our worship this morning. And as we go from this place, carry the light of Christ with us into the world. I pray all this in his name. Amen. So in the summer of 1994, I sat in a crowded movie theater and I watched the movie Forrest Gump for the first time. Give me a little head nod if you remember the movie Forrest Gump. It won Best Picture that year. It was, it was quite an interesting movie, a lot of things to keep you engaged. But I remember that I saw it with a group of people who'd never seen it before. Again, the theater was completely full. And I remember that the part of the movie that got the biggest reaction from the audience was the part at the end where Forrest Gump buys his friend Jenny's old house and he has it bulldozed to the ground. You remember this part of the thing? Dick, I think there's a picture back there you can, you can click on and help us see this. Yeah, he stands looking on as a bulldozer demolishes a house that his childhood friend Jenny grew up in. And everybody in the theater clapped and cheered and celebrated. Some people might have even have stood up. And if you don't remember the movie, you might be wondering why were they so jazzed about a house getting torn down. But if you remember the movie, then you remember that this was the house that Jenny's alcoholic father abused her in. This is the main point of the movie. It's part of her whole character's trajectory. Why she's so lost, why she's looking for love, why she has so many problems in life. And Forrest Gump is there for her all along the way. And then finally, he's able to purchase the house and just <clears throat> have that thing demolished. Because what should have been a safe place for Jenny, what should have been a loving home where she was cared for and protected, ended up being a place where she was hurt and terrorized. And so when that house came crashing down, yeah, you better believe that me and everybody else in that movie theater celebrated. We said good riddance to that place. I start here because that's what we're going to see in Revelation this morning. We are going to see that God is taking a bulldozer and he is demolishing the great city that has also not fulfilled its God-ordained purpose. The image, like I said, that we're going to see is of a prostitute riding on a beast with seven heads and ten horns, just kind of an average day for the book of Revelation, the usual stuff, where we're going to find out that she is a symbol of for a great empire whose evil actions are finally being called into account. So let's listen to what Revelation has to say. John's vision continues. One of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came to me and said, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. So then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. And she held a cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. And the name that was written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. And don't worry, there's plenty more. <laughs> there's two whole chapters of what's going on here. The prostitute is the means, or one of the means, by which Satan is depicted as the dragon, in Revelation, deceives the people of the world. She is deceptive. This is actually a very appropriate image we come to find out. You have this beautiful woman who's dressed in fine clothes, glittering with gold and gems and pearls, and she's got this goblet in her hand, and the goblet looks pretty nice too. It's gold, and she looks like she's having a great time. If you saw her, you might be like, hey, what's she drinking? Maybe I should drink that too. Wait, where's she going? Where's the after party? If she's there, I think I want to be there as well. But what is revealed to us in these passages is as you get closer to her and you look inside her goblet, you see that it's blood. Ugh, that's not what I thought. 
It's the blood of the martyrs. What's described here, the the wording that we heard, was abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. Now, I've studied the Bible long enough to know that when you see the word filth in Scripture, that is a polite way of saying something that is a lot more uncouth. A better word to describe what is happening here is a word that you're not supposed to say in church. I want you to keep that in mind. What is revealed here is that what looks shiny and that you get up close and then you realize, oh, oh, no, that's not at all what I thought I was getting into. It's something much more disgusting, much, much worse. You might be reminded of the words of Jesus when he was describing the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. He said, you guys are like whitewashed tombs. You look nice. And, he's, and they're like, okay, thanks, man. We, we try to look nice. He said, you look nice on the outside, but like a whitewashed tomb, what's on the inside is just dead people's bones, decay and filth and stench. What we are being told here is that we should not fall for the wiles of the great prostitute. Don't chase after something that is shiny and alluring. But what we find out is that this represents the evil empire that has deceived many people for years and years and years. You're not supposed to fall for it, but for some reason people keep falling for it. And this is one of those times in Revelation where you actually get an explanation of what these symbols mean. Sometimes you're just kind of left to wonder, or you're supposed to intuit it yourself because it's a cultural thing. We find ourselves in the dark. But today we get a pretty thorough explanation. The woman, we find out in verse 18, is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. And the seven heads, well, those are the seven hills that the woman sits on and the seven kings. Verse 9 tells us, ten horns are the ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but you know what? They're bad news as well. So Revelation 17 goes on to explain what this image represents. And people throughout history have tried to do the math and try to figure out, oh, okay, so there's, there's seven rulers and, and five of them have already come and one of them hasn't risen yet and one of them's maybe on his way in, maybe on his way out. You can get really kind of wrapped up in the details of this. And as I've said before, you can do that and people even try to apply it to modern day rulers. Well, what does this horn represent? Oh, that might be this ruler. Oh, that sounds a lot like this, but I would recommend don't get lost in that. See what the big picture that's being reported here. And that is, we're talking about Rome. John is describing something he sees and saying, that is Rome. That is the city of Rome. That is the empire of Rome. That is the evil ills of Rome. And we know this. We we may not know this, but we can learn this. Uh, There are literally and famously seven hills in Rome. You can go there today and look at them. Well, maybe not today. Maybe buy your plane ticket today, fly there tomorrow, and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hills in Rome. Yep. Story checks out. There were these coins that were minted by the Emperor Vespasian. You can see them not super well, but there's a, there's a picture of one of these coins that was found. That was, this was, these were probably in circulation during the time that John wrote this. This depicts a woman, and she's sitting on, guess how many hills? Seven hills. Uh, and this, it says Roma. Underneath, on the front of the the head, uh, front side of the coin was the face of Emperor Vespasian. And here, this is Rome, the deification of Rome, the glorification of Rome. She's this wonderful woman sitting on these seven hills. I wonder if that's what John had in mind. But if you were hearing this in the first century, you'd be like, ah, okay, a woman sitting on seven hills. Oh, and they're bad news? Okay, this is an indictment against Rome. This is the empire that shed the blood of God's people and also continues to perpetuate hurt and terror. And many people are deceived by her glory and her splendor, and they're lured away by her. And as we read on in Revelation 17, we hear what we find out what happens to the prostitute is that the kings that she's in league with, they kind of turn on her. And this, this, this domination system that's bad news kind of destroys itself from the inside. The evil empire that was once so strong that holds people in place and tries to maintain law and order is actually headed for a fall. And then in chapter 18, what you hear are the cries of lament, people that are sad to see her go or sad that she didn't live up to her potential. Revelation 18, starting in verse one. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. And with a mighty voice, he shouted, fallen, fallen, is Babylon the great, 
She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. So like Jenny's abusive home, the great city did not do what it was supposed to do. It didn't provide safety and stability for God's children. It didn't bring all kinds of people together for, uh, to create beauty and culture. It was not a system of interconnected relationships that bear the image of God and reflect his goodness into the world. Instead, what we see here is that it became a den of demons, a place for unclean spirits, a place for the corrupt to hang out and be harbored. It's a deceptive prostitute who is drunk on the blood of the martyrs. It devised systems to take advantage of others. It valued money over mercy. There's one part later on in the chapter where the merchants of the city start crying out and lamenting over all the things that they're not going to be able to do, the, the things they're not going to be able to buy and sell in the city of Rome anymore. They say, oh man, we used to have such a great time. We got rich transporting gold and fine linens and spices. It's this long list of things. Livestock and human slaves. Man, that was such a good trade. Wait a minute. Did they say human slave? That's something that they're lamenting and going, ah, oh, what a bummer. We don't get to get rich off of this human misery anymore. So, again, like Jenny's abusive home, it is something that's going to be destroyed. And the warning that is sounded out for God's people is, get out. You don't want to be underneath that thing when it goes down. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as, give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and the luxury that she gave herself. In her heart, she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen. I'm not a widow. I will never mourn. But therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. In the middle of chapter 18, you get this threefold woe. Again, three different voices lamenting the loss of this great city. But it's from people who are sad because they got rich off of her practices. The kings are sad to see Babylon destroyed, even though they were part of the ones that are going to bring her down. The merchants involved in human trafficking lament. And the sailors who get rich by ripping people off, they're bummed out too. It's kind of like, back to that Forrest Gump image, It'd be like if while Forrest was demolishing Jenny's house, if Jenny's father came up and stood next to him and said, oh man, what a shame. That was such a great house. I loved that house. It was so secluded. It was so accommodating to me. That's deplorable. That's pure evil. That's what you have in Revelation 18. People are sad because... Their opportunity to do evil is no longer there. But God's people rejoice when something that is terrible is removed, when God's justice is realized. Rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets, for God has judged her with the judgment that she imposed on you. And then at the end of chapter 18, you get this image that's similar to something you see in the prophet Jeremiah and something that'll sound familiar that's something that Jesus said about anybody who takes advantage of people. Anybody who harms a child, it would be better off if they took a millstone and did what? Tie it around your neck. Jump in the sea. That would be a better day for you than if God's justice catches up with you. An angel's going to throw a millstone into the sea and say, that's Babylon. That's Rome. 
Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a millstone and threw it into the sea and said, With such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. And the musics of harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No worker of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone grinding will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's important people. By your magic spell and all, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people for all who have been and of all who have been slaughtered on the earth. So that's what the celebration that's what the four hallelujahs that you only find in Revelation 19 are celebrating. The destruction of the evil empire. And we see here again what we saw last week. We talked about God's justice and how the voices in Revelation, the voices from the heavens say, God's judgments are just. God's judgments are true. And the people who are receiving them are deserving. And we see that here again. It was found In her was found the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people, all who have been slaughtered on the earth. And we talked when we introduced Revelation about how it's a, it's, a, it's a document, it's a book that has different purposes. It's liturgical. So we learn how to worship from Revelation. It's a letter to churches. So we, we kind of learn what it means to be the church from Revelation. We also said it's a theopolitical document. What? What does that mean? That means it's critical of the empire's claims of divinity. Remember what Rome was trying to sell to the people back in its time. Rome was saying, Caesar is Lord, but Revelation reveals, no, Jesus is Lord. Rome says, we're the ones who brought you peace. Hello, the Pax Romana, anybody remember that? Revelation reveals Babylon, the deceptive prostitute who drinks the blood of the martyrs. I don't know where you, how you pay for your Pax Romana, but uh, it's not quite what the advertisements say. Rome said, you pledge allegiance to our flag, and Revelation reveals those who are loyal to the Lamb will have eternal life. So Revelation is very intentional about confronting the lies that the powers that be are trying to sell its people, and it warns us today about being lured in by the Roman Empire's siren song. You may have noticed that speaking of words and whether or not they appear in Revelation. You don't see the word Rome in Revelation. I've been talking a lot about Rome, and, you know, we made that connection between Babylon and Rome. It does not say Rome at all. Maybe it's to be a little bit cryptic, to fly under the radar, but I think one of the values of it not saying, this is about first century Rome, instead they use the term Babylon, which you see this in other parts of Scripture. Babylon is whatever evil empire is in charge and is raising itself up to a level that is higher than Jesus the Lamb. Uh, And you can go throughout history, and you can apply the term Babylon to any empire that is assuming power, raising itself up. You could say that the Spanish Empire was Babylon, or the Russian Empire was Babylon, the British Empire, and maybe even the American Empire. And I realize that Memorial Day weekend may be the wrong time to ask this question, but are there any similarities between first century Rome and 21st century America? Have we grown powerful and wealthy at the expense of others? Do our values of liberty, strength, pride, and wealth clash in any way with the kingdom values of sacrifice, mercy, humility, and generosity. I don't want to touch that nerve too hard. And to be fair, there are times when kingdom purposes and purposes and actions of a superpower happen to coincide and overlap. It's not like any nation or this nation particularly is only evil all the time. But the question we have is, what should a Christian do when the kingdom of God and the kingdom of men find themselves at odds with each other. What do we do? How do we live day to day? I think in a big way, that's what these chapters in Revelation are about. And keep in mind, this was a letter that was not written to Rome. 
This was not written to the government. It's, it's, it's about Rome in a very real way, but it was not sent to Caesar's palace. It was sent to whom? To the seven churches. Okay, so this is a message for the church. It reveals that Babylon the Great is heading for a fall. It's a, it's a warning. Don't be underneath that rubble. Don't be so connected with something that God is going to do away with in time. And you remember when we looked at the seven churches, when Jesus talked specifically to each of the seven churches and he praised them for some things, he said, you guys are doing some good things and I want to commend you for that. And then there's some things that you're not getting. You're not quite there. This is a good reminder that some of these things that they were doing were connected to the empire. They had been lured in. They had been seduced by what Rome was trying to say. They had kind of lost their way. They lost their allegiance to Christ, just kind of going with the flow of what everybody else was doing. The church in Pergamum and the church in Thyatira were both criticized for eating food that was sacrificed to idols and participating in sexual immorality. We don't get a lot of details of what that looked like, but it was, hey, this is something that people are doing. Yeah, but not my people. That's not what we should be doing. The church in Sardis was criticized for being dead in their faith, and it was mentioned that their white robes of righteousness had somehow become stained. And again, we don't get details on what that looks like. But it's a call that Jesus makes to them. Get out of there. Come away. You are too closely aligned with the values of Babylon. And the church in Laodicea, you may remember this because it's a graphic image of because you're lukewarm in your faith. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. I think some translations even say I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. Ew, gross. But they were lukewarm in their faith. They became rich and self-reliant, which is something that Babylon was guilty of perpetuating. Something that you heard in chapter 18. You're getting rich off people who are oppressed, people who are hurt, people who've been taken advantage of. And that's not God's justice. You are benefiting in ways that you should not. So we ought to see it kind of got a lashing there, but you remember a few weeks ago we asked the same question as we looked at the Jesus' words to the seven churches. We kind of used our imaginations a little bit and said, what if Jesus were sending John to give us a message today? What would he say to Tri-Valley? What things are we doing well? What things should we keep on doing and just be faithful in ways that we have been? And harder question, but maybe even more important is, what are some things he would say, you guys are missing it. And we asked you guys to share these questions around tables. And I didn't hear from everybody, but just one of the responses I heard as I talked to people afterward in the weeks following was a lot of people said, you know, in some ways I'm like the people of Laodicea. I'm comfortable in my faith. I'm, I'm, I'm wealthy and I try to, you know, keep things the way I like them. And maybe you could identify with someone who can describe their faith as being lukewarm. It was hot at one part, like a, like a nice fresh cup of coffee, but... And you got set down and became room temperature, and you go back to that, mm, doesn't really do anything for me anymore. I heard an interview along the same line as we're using our imaginations of, you know, what would the people from Scripture say to Christians of today? I heard an interview with a, a New Testament scholar spent, you know, over 40 years studying the New Testament world, was an expert in the, the writings of Paul and the epistles and all that. The interviewer asked the scholar this question. What do you think the Apostle Paul would guide American pastors to subvert today? It's kind of a wordy sentence, but the spirit of it is, you know, what would Paul say to Christians today? In what ways have we become more like Rome than like the kingdom of God? And his answer came quick. You could tell that he had thought about this before. And he said, I think it's five things. And you guys can do whatever you like with these. He said, one, Paul would criticize our obsession with politics as a solution to society's ills. Two, our militarism. The idea that we can win because we're more powerful. Three, our lack of compassion for the immigrants at our borders. Number four, radical capitalism, that is living in pleasure and living way beyond our means. And number five, inattentiveness of most Christians to Bible reading and prayer.
Maybe some of those sounds familiar. Maybe that's convicting for you. Maybe one of these makes you mad, or maybe this whole exercise, ah, he's just some guy. I don't want to listen to him. What does he know? Maybe that's true. But I want to call you this morning to pay attention to which of these five, or maybe more than one of them, makes you feel like, oh yeah, this is a good reminder for me as a follower of the Lamb. Or pay attention to which one makes you the angriest. Which is the one that you want to stand up and refute right now and say, that's way out of context, Jacob. Allow me to rebut that a little bit. Just pay attention to that. There may be something there. But again, like I said last week, you should spend less time caring about what Jacob thinks or what this scholar thinks and more time listening to what Jesus says. So here's what Jesus says. Those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and I sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Something to think about this morning. Kingdoms of this world will come and go. They're going to rise and fall. Whether those are, you know, nations, countries, or even just like business empires. Or if you want to like put a fine point on it, that could even mean our personal empires. The thrones that we construct for ourselves so that we can sit and be in charge and make sure people do our bidding. But those are all fleeting. They're not going to last. And that's a good reminder. It's part of what Revelation is reminding the Christians. Rome is everywhere. Rome is huge. It seems like they're always going to be in charge. Well, it lasted a while, and it's not so powerful nowadays. I don't know my great-grandfather's name. It's a little bit of a leap, so go with me. You may not know your great-grandparents' names. In however many years, my great-grandkids, great-great-grandchildren probably won't know my name, and I'm kind of okay with that. I don't think that's the point of my life. The kingdom of God, on the other hand, is eternal. It lasts. It matters beyond what we do now. So I want to end with a quote. It's a little more positive because I could tell I brought the mood down on our holiday weekend. I want to end with a quote that I heard recently that gives me a lot of hope and assurance. And the quote is, the kingdom of God is never in trouble. I thought about that and I went, yeah, amen. You know, the kingdom of man might be in trouble. The kingdom of Jacob might have some financial trouble. The kingdom of Tri-Valley may have a, a limited lifespan. The kingdom of whatever country might be in trouble. But the kingdom of God is never in trouble. And along those lines, we're going to end with a song that reminds us as well. So I'm going to invite our uh, wonderful praise team back up here to come and help us prepare to sing the words of this song. Time is filled with swift transition. None on earth, unmoved, can stand. So build your hopes on things eternal and hold to God's unchanging hand. Please stand and sing that along with us. Time is filled with swift transition. None of earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. You gotta hold. To God's unchanging hand, build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Trust in Him who will not leave you. Whatsoever years may bring, if thy earthly friends forsake. Still more closely to him cling. 
Unchanging hand, time is filled with swift transition. No other thumb move can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hope to God's unchanging hand. Hope. Please be seated. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. We want to end this morning with a time of prayer. And in the, the image that we see in Revelation of the prayers of the saints just being lifted up as this incense offering before the Lord and reaching his throne, we're going to have a little uh, a prayer chorus. In a moment, uh, instead of me leading us in a, ser- a prayer for everybody, I'm going to ask you to turn to the people near you and lift up the prayers of the Church of Tri-Valley right now. And so, Dick, if you could go to the next slide. I put the prayer requests that were um, just the ones that I paid attention to. I'm sure there's some that I forgot, but I want you guys to keep these people in your prayer. And as usual, every week we send out an email with more details. Speaking of details, I get asked every once in a while from people, like they, they call me or they, they'll, if we're talking, they'll say, oh, by the way, how's Deanne doing? And I'll tell you as much information as I know, but a better way to get accurate information, and I think what's better on uh, other levels too, is just call the people. If you're wondering how they're doing, they would love to know that you're thinking about them and praying for them, and they'll give you all the uh, gory details or or whatever. You will be informed and we will be better connected as a congregation. So, I mean, like I said, you can ask me and I'll share whatever I have, but I want to encourage us to get into the habit of using your church directories. Call these folks. Deanne uh, was home from the hospital last week. She's doing, the surgery went as well as can be expected. And um, she got home last week on Tuesday. Wes said that she's on pain medication. So the first week is just a lot of you know, letting the swelling go down, but they, you know, day of the surgery, they had her walking around the, the ward and just like, hey, get back on there. So pray for Deanne. Thank you to everybody who signed up on the meal train to bring meals for the Wolfords. I think there might be still be some opportunities to do that. Uh, keep Jan and Al Higdon in your prayers. Uh, Laban, I talked to her this week and her son came and visited her and then her other son is coming in, I think this week, but she's still over at the rehab facility in Tracy, and she's getting stronger. She said, and first report was she could go home after a month, but I talked to her on Wednesday, and she said they might say after two weeks she might be strong enough to go home. So praise God for that going well and for her getting stronger. Babs asked us to pray for her and Ralph, and she also mentioned that her new prosthesis is coming in this week, I think, on Thursday. So we're excited for you, Babs. We're keeping you in our, our prayers. Uh, Sandra, McMahon, Sandra McRandall's grandmother, Rachel Hurd, was taken into the hospital last week because of uh, some issue with her, her blood thinners and a, a brain bleed. And they got her admitted to a room, and I don't, I don't have an update, but you have Sandra's number, so you can call her and find out and uh, keep her in your prayers. Hannah, Rachel, Lorelai, Kristen are going to be our student speakers next week, so keep them in your prayers as they fine-tune their, their messages and as God works through what they're going to say. Keep Janae in your, your prayers as she's uh, fundraising and preparing for her mission trip to Ensenada, Mexico this summer. And keep, keep uh, Sylvia Skinner in your prayers. From what I hear, it's just more and more good news. But, you know, with every good news, there's still a little bit of wait and see and another scan and working things out. So we're praying for you, Sylvia and Wade. So that's what I want to invite you guys to do now is pray for these people and anybody else that you think of, pray for one another. Spend the next five or seven or ten or however many minutes you need praying uh, with the people around you or silently by yourself. It's your call. Ready? Go.